everybody. I'm Dr. Roseanne, and you're joining me for a very, very special episode with my friend, colleague, and it turned out is my cousin's wife, and I didn't know, and our pediatric de dentist, Dr. Maria Sheldon. And she's Hi. here to talk about her experience, her life-changing experience with neurofeedback and how, as I always remember it, Dr. Maria, it took that anxiety hum out of your belly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thank you. I would call you cuz. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> But I would love for people to, you know, so like, here's our story is I was taking my kids to you and everybody knows my, my, my max has pans. So I'm very suspicious of people. Maria doesn't know this part, but I'm a little suspicious of people, new practitioners. And Dr. Maria was probably the most thorough practitioner of anybody I went to. She would ask me very detailed questions, very caring, very, uh, just so lovely. And one day she literally says, I've got to talk to you. And she pulls me into a court, a closet and she <laughs> says, I have anxiety my whole life and I want to come to you. And I was like, okay. And at this point, I know that anxiety is in the inside and we never know what really goes on with anybody in the inside. And when you made the appointment, I saw your last name, which is Chaldone. And I said, where is your family from in Italy? And she's like, my husband's family is from Caserta in Italy. And I was like, we are cousins because it's an <laughs> unusual spelling. And it turns out, so I always say my cousin Maria. So, um, but I would love for you to, you know, talk about, you know, what, you know, what made you make that definer moment of saying, like, I've had anxiety my whole life. Um, and now I want something different. What, what happened in that moment for you? So I have had problems with anxiety in the past and I, I, you know, I've, I've managed it in different ways, but what happened right before I pulled you into the closet was my husband ended up having a cardiac surgery. And after he had the surgery, like sort of leading up to the surgery and after he had the surgery, I could feel my anxiety coming back and I didn't like it. And I didn't want to go back to that place because I earlier in my life, I was having like anxiety, to the point of panic attacks, and I never want to go there again. So I pulled you aside and I said, I, I think you have a better solution for me. And that's that's really that was that was the defining moment. I was like, yeah, I, and I, I don't think I, I knew that about your husband, about the cardiac. And, you know, the thing that I I remember talking so much about with you and I talk about you a lot with my really bright kids and their families, because you were this very bright kid. You know, you obviously went on to school, became a dentist. You know, you were a great student. And I don't think people knew you were anxious in the inside. Like, did your mom and dad, did they say to you, you know, Maria, you know, um, you know, typical things that people would say to, you know, somebody who might be anxious, who maybe is holding themselves back. Like, did they know, did you have belly aches? Did you have sleep problems when you were younger? Like what, what did it look like for you? And when did you know you were like probably a little more anxious than you should be? So this is the elephant in the living room that nobody talks about in my family. Everybody. Well, you know, Italians don't talk about anything, talk but about what we're serving at the dinner table. But I see it in all of us. All of us, and uh, Amen. The the biggest, I think that there, and I coming from an Italian family, you know this. Oh, you're anxious, eat something. <laughs> oh, you're sad, eat something. You're depressed, yeah. eat something. Eat something, eat something. So I, I mean, I see it in, and I, I see my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews. They struggle with it, and you know the stigma with mental illness. It's like you start telling. I, I'll never forget. I told a group of my closest friends, they are intelligent, educated women. And I told them, I said, this is what I'm doing for my um, anxiety. And the response I got from them was horrible. And it, it blew me away how ignorant it was, how awful it was. Um, I am so sorry, Maria. Yeah. The, and I thought, wow, I'm really sorry I even said anything. You know, they acted like I was having a lobotomy. And I'm like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, yeah. No. You know what I feel like some of that's about? It's very interesting because 
you know, I've had my struggles with other women, especially as a mom of a kid who has behavioral issues in the past. Um, people reject you because they think it's like a contagion. And, but I do think it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. horrible. You know what I mean? And you know, Max, he's a great kid. You know what I mean? Like, I so love nobody's, nobody's perfect people, but I feel like sometimes it triggers their stuff, Maria. So yeah. like you were taking care of your anxiety, but you just said it. Everybody has anxiety, right? It's just, what's the level does it bubble at? Right. And what do we do to, that's healthy to manage it? right? Are we, are we praying? Are we um, getting together with people we love? Are we, you know, are we walking every day? What are we doing? And it's so easy for a, for such life stressors, like a parent dying, your husband having a cardiac issue, a loss of a job, your kid having a hard time for it to flare into full blown anxiety. And I do think when the things get tough, right? You know, my friend Shauna always said to me, Jesus, people keeps people in your life and out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was like, thank you, Shauna, because that was like a great statement for me as hurtful as it is. I mean, those people, you realize you really can't rely on those women. You exactly. Know? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and one of the beautiful things about doing the neurofeedback was it allowed my anxiety to come down to a level where I could do other things. Like I felt comfortable doing other self-care things. You know what I mean? Like I no longer felt, I mean, uncomfortable going into a massage, you know, room, which was dark and closed and all the things that would trigger my anxiety. Like I, I feel comfortable doing those things now. So it really was a game changer for me. Really yeah. I, re I remember that moment, you know, I got that memory that runs like a movie reel so I can pull out little things and literally rewatch the whole episode. It's kind of crazy. Thank you, Philomena. She gave me that. And, um, and I remember sitting with you in, in the table and you saying to me, Roseanne, it's like I had a hum the entire time of my life. And I didn't know until it was gone. And you explained it was like the strum of a guitar. And I thought, was wow. up like that i go to bed like that it was awful it yeah was, and the, the one of the ways i coped with that was this go 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 like just in constant motion constant motion from the minute i wake up to the minute i went to bed i felt i always felt like i compelled i had to do something because this otherwise it was going to overwhelm me and i was going to have a panic attack and now that it's gone i am so in, i'm just enjoying moments from I'm enjoying, I'm living in a moment and enjoying that moment because I, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's, I don't fear anxiety. I don't fear having yeah. anxiety. And let me just say this, Dr. Maria Sheldon, like <laughs> you are as lovely as can be. When I said I was filming this podcast, you know, we have a lot of long-term employees, Nancy and Kathy, they were like, Dr. Maria, oh, we love her. She's so nice. And like, that was my experience with you as, as a, a coming into as a, as a, you know, a patient with my kids, you're always just so thorough and lovely and great communicator. And just always made me feel like, wow, she really knows what she's doing and like getting expert care. Nobody would ever know you were anxious. Yeah. It, it doesn't come across. That's good. I guess. That's no, good. but right. I just think that's such an important point because when people, a lot of times people come to me in a crisis and then they go, oh, there were sleep problems. Oh, um, my daughter wouldn't get her driver's license because yeah. she was scared of driving. Um, oh, um, you know, worries about the test. Like, you know, there's a healthy amount of worry. And then there's a worry where you're like, what's going on? Right. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I was trying to explain to somebody the other day, like my, you know, my youngest, John Carlo, he's a Virgo. So he's got to know everything in advance. <laughs> Virgo. So, Virgo. What's Virgo. the plan? Yeah. I can tell him we're doing 17 things. And he's like, as long as I know in advance, I'm good. If I spring him one thing, he's like, wait, you didn't tell me that. I don't really like that. What do you mean the tutor's coming over today? You know what I mean? Like, right. so, um, and so I have to watch it with him because if, when is it normal? He asked me once, he's like, got it. If he started asking me seven times, then I know there's a worry about it. Right. So we have to look for those little behaviors so that, you know, when it comes to kids and also to look for those things within ourselves. Are we are we avoiding people? Are we um, drinking too much alcohol? Are we Netflix watching? Are we, you know, not getting up to exercise when we know that it really relieves stress for us? Like, 
what are the things that we could do to actually improve it, right? You know, so I love that the neuro unlocked for you that you could even do more self-care. Yeah. Yeah. Up here, you know. Yeah, because it's been a number of years since you stopped neurofeedback. I mean, it had to be at least three or four years. And I would say probably four. And um, and you really have continued to really like it unlocked it and you moved forward. Like, mm -hmm. and um, when you think about your life today, like, what do you try to do for self-care? How do you try to st structure your life? Because it's not a one and done. This becomes something you do. And then you continue to deepen with other activities, what I call brain keys. Right. It just, just fun. This is a funny, I don't know, anecdote. When I drive past your office on Route 7, I get instantly calm because of when I would leave neurofeedback and I would, I would be so calm coming. Yeah. You know, it's, it was, it's like a weird tissue memory, I guess you would call it. Right. Um, but I love that. But also too, you got like, you know, you had the, we had the ladies and you were chatting with the lady. It was just like a good experience all around. You know what I mean? It was great. Actually. I, I honestly, it was awesome. Um, but getting back to your question, I do yoga. I love to do yoga. That's one of my favorite things So like yoga and I'm invested now in like um, massage and facials. So like that, those kinds of things. I get a lot of exercise. I walk, and interestingly, I walk with my dogs in places that I normally would not have gone because the whole, the whole fear of I'm going to get lost in the woods. I'm going to, you know what I mean? Now I have a totally different attitude about it. Yeah. Well, your anxiety, the kindling is gone, right? So now you can distinguish. <laughs> part of my brain comes through. Like, you're not going to get lost. You're not, <laughs> you're not going to get lost in the woods. You know what I mean? And I can also say things to myself when I feel the anxiety coming on, like, okay, this worst case scenario is this, and that's not so bad, you know, which is when you're anxious, that's not, that's the rational side of your brain. I feel like is just gone. Yeah. Well, you know, and when you're so heightened, you know, we lose control of our rational thought. It doesn't matter what kind of degree you have or how high your IQ is or what street you live on, people. I think that's what people don't realize. You know, our brain can go in a fight, flight, or freeze very easily when it's in a red state all the time. And yeah. that one specific incident has to happen. It could just start raising because you're just always moving into this anxious state. And so when you start to regulate and have a calm brain, which is exactly what you're talking about, you then can use your thinking brain and be like, okay, yep. I'm not going to get lost. Right. So I love that you say that. Now, being a special, you know, um, a pediatric dentist, and I know you do a great job with special needs kids. And um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? Like, you know, you're you're always so um, communicative with your patients. Like, what are people talking about when they come into you? Like, what are their concerns? Like, are you seeing trends? You're seeing a lot more kids on the spectrum because I know we've talked about that. What are you seeing? Yeah. Um I think one of the things that really upsets me the most is how much anxiety there is in these kids and the fact that they feel like they have no outlet. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, mostly in my high school aged kids, I feel like there's this, well, you should, you know, just grow out of it or whatever, or you shouldn't be anxious or whatever. But I see a lot of it. And I, I almost, I said to my dental assistant the other day, you almost feel like there should be like a, a support group or something for them. Yeah in high school so they can recognize, yeah, this is anxiety, but these are the ways that we can manage it, you know? Um, I also see a lot of depression. I see a lot of kids that are on um, antidepressive medications and that, that really bums me out too. Not because I don't think it's necessary, but like, I feel like they're not exploring the other options. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, and this is like, you're such a point. Do you ever talk to people about things like supplements and neurofeedback? Are the people ever open to those conversations? Or you're, I know you, she takes a very detailed history. Like, I truly, you know, like, do, do, the, do they ever come to a point of trust where, I mean, or let's reframe that. What would you like parents to know who are in this situation? Like, what would you say to a parent who is considering doing neurofeedback or changing their diet or supplements or using more natural solutions? What do you want them to know so they can shortcut it and not spend 20 years being anxious or 30 years being anxious? What would you want them to know? 
it's like, yes, 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 go, <laughs> go do what you normally do, which is you go, you talk, you, you get, I mean, I encourage people every day in not just like these situations, but with any kind of dental situation, like when they're going to the orthodontist, go, go for a consultation, get the information, process the information. You don't have to make any decisions, but process it. See if this is something that's going to work for, for you. If patients, sometimes the teenagers, when the parent is not there, they will talk to me. I'll ask them a little bit about, you know, how they've been feeling, you know, not not physically, they'll tell me physically and I'll ask them, but, but how's it going with, you know, other things, how are things at school? And sometimes when they say that, I'll tell them that there are, you know, there are alternatives, but it takes a lot of trust to do that. And then I yeah. often like the parents, you know, because there's such, I hate to say, keep saying this, but there's such a stigma. I feel like the parents feel like I'm labeling them or you know what i mean or i think less of them if if that's the situation a lot of times they don't even want to tell me that they're having trouble with depression or anxiety and especially me like if you're having trouble with anxiety i need to know that in the dental chair like i want to make sure that we make you as comfortable as humanly possible and yeah. that or if you so you find you, you know? find people they're on the meds but they don't want to talk about don't want to talk or the condition go to, I, I'm experiencing this with my brother-in-law right now. And, and unfortunately he has had to retire from his job because the anxiety has been so crippling. And I have been trying and trying and trying to tell him medication isn't the only option. Like you really, there are a lot of other options, but you know, it's, it's really it's hard. So hard. Yeah. What, what I mean, so we, so the stigma is a part of that. What else do you like for, from your point of view, because you're so great at conversing with people. Is it, for me, I always feel like people want a quick fix. Yes. Like, you feel like, yeah. And, you know, you didn't just do neurofeedback. You made behavioral changes. You pushed yourself. You were like, oh, my anxiety's down. I'm going to grow. Yeah. I'm going to get outside my comfort zone so that I'm like, wait, this is, I can tolerate stress. So you did the behavioral part of it. I find that's a really hard part. I think people think even if the meds help and they, you know, take it down a little bit, they don't realize you actually have to make micro changes. You got to do the work. That's, I think that's a huge stumbling block for people is they have to do the work. I think, I honestly think that, um, and this is just opinion, obviously, but I think people don't want to hear that the problem is them. Do you know what I mean? I think people yeah. want to that the problem is the school system the problem is the dentist the problem is the doctor you know what i mean i, I don't i don't think they want to yeah oh like no and i try to explain that it, all the time, right like, I mean, you're right i mean there's there's choices we make and like when it comes to a kid you know or even an adult we can think of it we can we can go away from it and kind of look at it as like a, from a movie, right? That it's a nervous system that's dysregulated. We try to depersonalize it and say, okay, my brain is dysregulated. What behaviors could I implement, right? I had a mom that was getting upset about something and I told her, we're not going to fact fight, okay? Yeah. I'm here to give you help and support and Let's be a parent detective. Let's dive in and let's figure out what's causing the stress at home. She was like, okay. So I was like, number one reason. She's like, when, when I tell her no, number two, when um, uh, I ask her to wear a different outfit, I was like, okay, wasn't expecting that. So <laughs> we got in there and three was homework. So, right. um, and we put some real solutions around that, right? And this was somebody who tried all these meds and it didn't work and then came to me, has seen some difference. It's only like 20 sessions in, has seen some differences, but is like looking for a magic. And I was like, wait a second, your kid's like 16 years old. It's not going to happen overnight. But now right. we know these are the three biggest hurdles that cause conflict. You have to make some changes, right? You know, right. so you're being a mother of a college kid who's like, <laughs> Is he like se seven feet tall? I mean, how tall is Sam? Six foot two. Yeah. yeah. He's big. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the picture I posted him with my mom? She's yeah. Four. Oh my goodness. I know. <laughs> he looks like a giant. He looks like Andre the Giant. You're totally he right. Does. 
Um, <laughs> you know, when you think about like his teenage years, which is, you know, right here, you know, um, and you talk about teenagers being anxious and stuff, was there ever a time where you were concerned about him or maybe he came to you concerned about one of his friends and like, what conversations did you have about managing stress that you felt like was helpful with your own child? So that's, that's a good question. Sam was always surrounded by great coaches. And so when there was things that he didn't want to talk about with his parents, um, he had coaches, he had really good coaches. We also have really good um, friends, very good close friends. And he always felt comfortable talking to her. And she also has a background in counseling. So there's that. Now that he is in college, we know that he's been using the wellness center there. And he hasn't been afraid to, to get a counselor at the wellness center and talk about some of the stressors that he's having in college. So I think from watching me go through it. I think that was huge for him because I think it took, and we, I tried very hard to take the stigma out of it. Like this is, this is what happens. This is, yeah. real. and the more you try to bury your head in the sand, it's like radioactive waste. It just bubbles up again mm -hmm. and at the worst times in your life. It's so, oh my gosh. Amen. Let's <laughs> say that again. The more you try to bury it, the more it will bum it up, bum, bubble up because that is the truth. It will come and bite you in the butt when you don't right. need it to be possible times. Yeah. And right. you know what I hear in what you did with Sam is that you made communication a priority. Like right. there was no shame. There's no blame. Yeah. And you were I, like, you could talk I, it out. I never hid any of that. I told them why I was going. I told them how much it was helping me. I never, I never hid it. Like I never made it seem like it was shameful because when you don't talk about something, it becomes shameful, whether you say that yeah. or not. The more you don't talk about it, there, there's always association with shame. I, I never, I told them where I was going. I told them how much better I felt yeah. when I was going and how much, I think he could appreciate how much of a better parent I was because I wasn't always concerned about myself. And like, yeah. you know, and you I, know it's, it's so funny. We feel like we've I, come so far generationally, Maria, yeah. you know, and, um, but we haven't just like you had that experience. And recently, uh, my, my, you know, my 84 year old dad, who's a hot ticket and my, my mother just passed away. So now his, he, he goes out and hangs out with Max who's homeschooled and 17 and Max did something and he didn't like it. And I said, you know, dad, Max is doing the best he can. He has a mental health issue. And he goes, shh, 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 shh. he's going to hear you, Rosie. <laughs> and I said, dad, he knows about it. We talk right. about it. He is a therapist. And I go, if he had cancer, would you be hiding it? Exactly. Or diabetes. You're right. You're that right. Diabetes, right? I, it, that nothing. I have to say, nothing bothers me more than that. And that's, I, know. I feel like that is the biggest problem to these younger kids getting help and doing things that they need to do because to get better is because of the stigma. Well, and and the meds, as we like, literally have just skyrocketed med use in yeah. particularly in this pa pandemic. It is not the answer, right? So this is what I want to say. Yes, I'm all about natural solutions. I am opposed to medication being the first choice for a developing brain. Amen. Um, <laughs> so you can't argue with that, people, okay? Yeah. And meds are completely overprescribed. Um, yeah. Like five, my friend, Dr. Elisa Song, told me the other day that 520 million antibiotic prescriptions are done in a year and half are for kids. And 70% of those are incorrectly prescribed. Awesome. <laughs> I'm like, holy moly, that's just antibiotics. You know what I mean? So it's like, wow. You know, and you listen to that and you're like, well, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And everyone thinks antibiotics are no big deal, but they destroy the gut microbiome. And then you're more anxious and depressed. Very judicious with it. But, you know, yeah. uh, I'm sure you know this. You walk the line between being judicious and getting sued. So great. You know yeah. I mean? You have, you have to be careful. Right. But um, what I hear from you, the message is communicate, talk about it, and take action on it, right? Yeah. And then integrate things into your life to maintain, right? And also, too, what I love is that you really realize nobody's perfect. We all got our own stuff. It's what you do with it, right? And you became a role model for mental health for your son. 
Yeah. Right. And he prioritizes his own mental health. He might just go to a therapist because he feels like this is I'm used to it. I have a comfort level. And when I have a problem, this is how I deal with it instead of it bubbling into something else. Right. You know, I told him you don't even have to have a problem. If you yeah. download, you can go. I have to I do want to include something in this conversation that really also bothers me. And that is. If our insurance companies were on board with more than just prescribing medications, I think you would see an enormous amount of change in the mental health of our kids. I think one of the biggest hurdles Definitely. besides stigma is that they parents are struggling to, you know, to keep it together financially. And then the idea of doing 20 sessions, it's it's financially, it's a burden. Right. That you, can't, you know what I mean? Right. Well, and, and it and it feels like a burden because you're making an investment in time and money. Right. But the the cost of therapy for one year at two hundred dollars a session is ten thousand and two hundred dollars, I believe. To check my math on that, it's over ten thousand dollars. Right. And that's therapy that's not working if if your brain is dysregulated. So talk therapy only works when your brain is in a regulated state. Right. So, um, and I believe in neurofeedback. I believe in PMF. I believe in supplements. You know, there's just a lot of things that are out there. And of course I'm going to be, you know, I have all of those things coming. There's a lot of ways to calm the brain. We just have to work on calming the brain. Right. Um, and sometimes you have to do things like neurofeedback or other therapies because you're so dysregulated. Right. So right. that's okay too, you know, but the pill shouldn't be the first solution. You should investigate. But the pill is the first solution because that's what the no. insurance companies pay for. I know. I the insurance company will do it. That's, that's what your provider is telling you. And that's what you think you should ask for. And that's why your conversation with me is so important because you are unveiling as a, you know, a, a physician, you know, some a dentist and, and you're getting in there and telling people I'm a successful person with an awesome home life. And this happened to me. You know, <laughs> that is a big deal. there's lots of solutions. I think that's a huge part of the problem. I think people don't think that there's any other solutions for them. There's lots of, no. lots, lots of solutions. Dr. Rosian has lots of options for you. You just have to, you know, you have to be open to it and you have yeah. to No, And, you know, we even have like, we have our Facebook group, natural parenting solutions. You can go to www.drrosian.com forward slash group, or you can just go to Facebook group and it's a way to get in there and start it right. Not everything is DIY, but boy, you can get lots of info. Dr. Maria, as we end this awesome episode that brings so much hope and lays out a path for individuals to take care of themselves, not just for themselves, but for their family. What would you say to somebody who is considering working with us and not just doing neurofeedback, but being part of our brain behavior reset program? What would you say to them? How would you explain or encourage them to work with us? I would say absolutely walk through the door, sit down with Dr. Roseanne and find out what your options are because you will be so surprised to find out how many options you have. And I can honestly tell you that it neurofeedback was a game changer for me, but there are so many other things that you can do. The office is lovely. The staff is lovely. It, it was just an amazing experience and really a life-changing experience for me. I, I'm forever grateful to Dr. Roseanne and the staff for really for looking out for me and finding the best solutions for me and, and making that happen. Dr. Maria, I love you. And I'm glad that we're somehow related. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your podcast. <laughs> and you can find uh, Dr. Maria at www.riverroadkids.com in Shelton, Connecticut. She's my dentist. My <laughs> dentist. And um, she's there. She's amazing. And if you're interested in working with us on our Brain Behavior Reset Program, you can go to drrosanne.com forward slash apply. We only take a small amount of people because we love you up and you get the brain trust. But thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And I really just think you're amazing. And I, I feel blessed to have been a part of your transformation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for making it happen for me. Yeah. 
Be well. And wherever you are in the journey, mamas and papas, or ex is exactly where you need to be. You just need to start with one small action, be consistent, and watch the change happen. Mm -hmm.